Okay, so this is me. Uh, my name is Meredith Town. Um, I have been teaching in the DOE officially for eight years, in the system for 10. I am a model teacher. Um, I am licensed in both uh, secondary English as well as theater K-12. Um, I am a Big Apple Award nominee. Uh, I may have seen it. I was the teacher who they talked about in Canon, English teacher Learn to Code in New York Magazine this fall. Um, I've been at APSI for three years. I came in in their, their second year. Um, and before teaching, I did work professionally in theater. I, I worked primarily as a milliner for Broadway and opera, as well as a union dresser and stagehand. So that was my first career. Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you today. Um, I, as I said, I am not a computer science teacher. So I'm bringing the other perspective um, for those of you who are CS teachers, how to support content. And for those of you that are content teachers, what you might be able to do in your own classroom. So is it true, can an English teacher learn to code? So last spring, Sean, who you just met, set up a workshop for content teachers to try and learn how to do Scratch. It's like, are you interested? Great, we're gonna take you out of the building for a day and we're gonna do a one day boot camp. I was like, okay, I can do this. So as we were kind of going through, there were about eight of us, as we were going through and kind of learning base, very basics of Scratch, I started going, oh, there's a lot of connections between the language in Scratch and the language in theater. Um, this is really interesting. This might be something that I can actually do, which felt foreign at the moment, but as I spent more time thinking about it, I was like, nope, this is actually possible. So um, my first Scratch project, and this is the one that I made that day, and it's certainly not fancy by any stretch. So um, we use a mnemonic called HIT in English, and or, so it's hook, intro, topic, thesis. And you just click through, and the students, in theory, could go through and learn about HIT. Not, not fancy, but good for the basics, right? So as my thinking evolved, it became more about, not about me creating tools using Scratch, but how can my students use Scratch as the tool that they use for content? So um, the clearest connection for Scratch is narrative storytelling. Um, so really, it can be used anywhere where you want to have a story arc. So whether it's in theater or English or even in social studies where we're talking about history or even in science where you're talking about the evolution of a cell, right? Um, Any time there's a story arc, you can use Scratch. So the better question was, how can CS and content teachers support each other through integrating learning experiences for students? So I gave myself permission to do three different things. One, I didn't have to be the expert in the room. Um, students could be my teachers. I found myself saying to them a lot, you know way more about Scratch than I do. Teach me, right? Show me how it works. Show me what works best because I'm not the expert. And it was okay if it didn't work. It was the first time I was trying it and I wasn't sure. It was a risk, right? I was stepping out of my comfort zone as a theater teacher. I've been teaching theater a long time. I've been working in theater even longer. Um, and bringing in something so foreign felt really scary and a big risk, but I was like, okay, I'll try it. We'll see how it goes. Um, because as I've learned, CS is as much about process as about product. So uh, these are my kids. These are my current freshmen. Um, so theater at APSI is a semester-long course. We meet three times a week for one hour. Uh, it is a blueprint-aligned course. Uh, if you don't know, theater is, or arts are required for graduation in New York City. You have to have two semesters. In my course, I cover history, improv, solo and group performance, directing, and playwriting, which is a lot for 16 weeks. Um, so after learning more about Scratch, um, I decided to put it into the group performance and directing component of my course, um, partially because the first time I did it was in the fall, and. Um, I knew students would have almost a semester of Scratch under their belt because that's the platform they used for ninth grade. Because um, if I'd started in the fall, they wouldn't have had enough context. But in theory, they would be ready 
in November, December-ish to try something on their own. So I designed a five-step process. So the first step was picking acting scenes. In the fall, we did uh, movie scenes. Um, this semester, we're partnered with Theater for New Audience, so everyone's doing a scene from Pericles, which probably no one has seen or read because no one teaches it, um, but it's great. It's basically Shakespeare ripped off the Odyssey. It's, um, and it has a happy ending, which is nice. So all that my current kids are doing scenes from Pericles. Um, and that's our teaching artist, Albert. So the second step is um, creating blocking. So this is where we start talking about directing fundamentals. Um, theater has its own code that we use for writing blocking. Um, and this is an example of a script with blocking on the right. Um, and an example would be Romeo crosses down right and quarter turns, right? So this is a lot of the shorthand, right? So this, this blocking, right, the code of theater goes to kids and they use this to start creating their project. So part three um, was about uh, doing a paper prototype. We didn't want them to just jump into Scratch. After conversations with both Eric Lotta and Sean, it was clear to me that students have, they can't just, they want to dive into Scratch and just play, but sometimes you have to hold them back and say, let's, let's plan it first, right? Which is why we write out our blocking first in theater, right? Let's plan it first. Let's think about the movement first. So um, Sean and I had a meeting and, and designed a, a flip book project, right? So you guys have all done flip books, right? Animates. Um, so I created a template, said, you know, you need to show the movement of each character moving through the set over the course of time. So it shows your blocking, right? In, a, in, in an ideal world, your paper blocking looks like your flip book, first two connections. So then the fourth step, is their scratch project. So then they've got their theater blocking, they've got their flip book, so they've started to visualize, then they go and start rendering it in scratch. So their scratch project should look like, their flip book should look like their theater blocking. And finally, they perform. Their culminating performance should look like their scratch project, which looks like their flip book, which looks like their paper blocking. So. What it does is it allows students to experience movement in multiple platforms. For our students that learn differently, I found that it's a really great way for them to find different access points. So some kids are, are very artistic and are able to draw stuff out. My kids who struggle verbalizing were able to do the flip books really well. Um, my kids who have stage fright <laughs> and didn't want to get up and perform were able to kind of take some ownership of the Scratch project. So there were lots of access points for different learners, which was great. Um, so this was, <laughs> this is um, Jordan's project that he did with Alex. And this was their first Scratch project. And I think I did his work. Yay. All right. I can show you a little bit of this. So. This was the one from the fall. So this was the first course. So you can see they had to include um, the number of characters in the scene. They had to have the dialogue that the characters say. In theory, they have some setting and movement um, and hopefully think about timing, right? And it reflects the blocking that then we saw when they performed their scenes on stage. Um, I love this one because they actually found images from the movie and put them in and took some creative license, which was great. Um, so not bad for our first iteration of it. So here are my takeaways uh, for my first semester. So um, pacing for this unit was a huge part of what I needed to focus on. Kids needed enough time to do all the parts. I don't think I gave them enough time to do specific components, and as a result, some elements felt rushed. Um, I wasn't explicit enough in the connection between the movement of the four parts, even though I, in my head, had thought about it for so long, um, and it made so much sense to me. 
I was like, of course, if you do this, it looks like this, and it looks like this, and it looks like this, and this is how they all connect, and you want to make sure it's holistic. I, I clearly missed that step with my kids in the fall. So in my redesign, I've been much more explicit um, and direct in how I'm explaining the sequence. Um, the component of directing is um, movement, and this project is centered around thinking about movement in four different ways, and I wanted to make sure that I emphasize that. Um, and one of my hiccups was, how do I assess? So I got to the end of the semester and had all these projects to grade, and I didn't know how to assess them, because I was like, well, I'm not a coder. I don't know how to assess code in Scratch. I don't know how to look at it in the back end. I mean, I can look at it and go, oh, well, they've got these elements but what, how do I know if I'm even grading it right? So I had to step back and kind of have some further conversations. So those were my first semester takeaways. Um, this is the incarnation, and this is in one of the links in the master document that was shared with you. Um, so this is the rubric. We do mastery-based learning at Academy for Software, so um, we have four levels of mastery. Um, to pass, everyone has to be at at least apprentice, um, practitioner is kind of my benchmark, and then professional is the above and beyond. So this is the language that um, Sean and I started developing um, to create a rubric for Scratch that's for any sort of project that is about narrative, that covers a story arc. So the flipbook piece for me was one of the um, pieces where I felt the most frustrated with my teaching and delivery. Um, so I did have some understanding of why paper prototyping is so important to the process of CS, um, thanks to participating in hackathons that we do at school. Um, I've been able to see why asking them to plan out on paper and think that way helps them develop whatever comes next. Um, so I'm going to show you, actually I brought samples. So these were the first incarnations. So you can kind of see, these are a few of them. These were the initial flip books, right? And they're not bad. They're, you know, you can pass them around, sorry. Um, here, I'll circulate. Okay. Right, so you can see they're not super flippy, but, you know, kids are clearly thinking about um, how how blocking looks like in a stage space, right? They're okay, right? I was like, this isn't, but this isn't quite what I wanted. They don't really flip. They kind of rushed through it. I didn't spend enough time kind of talking about it. Um, so I went back to the drawing board. So this is the new version. Post-its. Duh, right? So this time, I reimagined the project. Um, to make round two more successful. So what I did is um, I gave them all post-its and you can see the difference. Granted, it's a lot more, but if you flip through, some of them are better than others. Um, but these, yeah. Uh, some of them start from the back and some of them start from the front. So you can see um, the kids spent a lot more time. I found a really good tutorial that I'm going to show you guys today about how to even do this on your own. Um, it pushes them to think about timing and movement and spacing, which are all things that Scratch asks kids to do. Um, but this, is, of course, is the paper prototyping step. So you can see the huge jump. In, and these were all turned in on Friday, so, and I got, I know, right? I was like, just in time! Um, and the kids were like, this, this was so fun, we loved making these. And when, when a kid says that to you, you're like, yes, that was the win. That's what I wanted. Do you uh, a lot of fun for this? They had two weeks okay. to do these, um, and they did them in pairs. So every group is four kids, but every group had to produce two flip books. So they worked with a partner. And then with that partner who they've been partnered with all semester long, they'll do their scratch project. So we'll do a paired programming model. How often do they meet in the week? How often do you see them? I see them three times a week. Oh, that's pretty good. So, but they were not able to do these in class. So all this work happened outside of class. Yeah. What grade is Ninth grade. Okay, how long do you them to create? 
Was about two weeks. No, no, but only oh. Uh, one hour, two hours. Oh, I don't know, because they did it outside of class. Yeah, um, I suspect you know some of them are more developed than others. The kids who spend more time, it, it, you're going to get to try it today, so you'll get to see how long it actually takes to do. Um, but it's definitely um, it was a successful step. So, um, so why create interdisciplinary learning, right? So. Project-based learning engages multiple learning methods, okay? Um, it's collaborative and creative for students. I'm a huge proponent of project-based learning. It lends itself to both theater and English. I believe in it, I love it. Um, it challenges students to think about the tools and skills they're learning in new ways. It gives teachers time and space to talk about their content through a new lens. Talking about theater through the lens of Scratch is very challenging for me and has made me cry, but I also really love it. Um, and it's exciting to see them get to think about it in a new way. Um, it's important for students to test their knowledge. So it's great. The CS classes tend to happen in a vacuum. And everything they do happens in their class. And they never apply what they know to other content areas. So this is a way for me to test my ninth grade CS teacher and go, are the things you're teaching them actually working? Are they absorbing them? Can they apply them in other contexts and use the skills that you have taught them in a different way? Hopefully, yes, right? Hopefully, at the end of this semester, when they've got a year of scratch under their belt, the projects that I get next month are even better than the one I showed you from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Um, learning doesn't happen in a vacuum, right? You have to communicate. You have to. I, have to barter time with Sean in order to kind of brainstorm and, and Eric and using the resources I have available to me. I know not everyone has CS teachers in house, but I'm very lucky to have that resource and I take advantage of it. Um, and I think in asking students to learn this way, it helps clarify the skills of theater that I'm asking them to develop. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of collaborative theater work. So um, innovation comes through collaboration. It is the, one of the main tenets of theater, right? All these different brains come together to create something. And you can't do a summative, like you can't have a final show unless you have all the people do their parts. So this works the same way. So now that you've seen the paper prototyping, I'm going to give each of you your own pad of post-its. And I'm going to ask you to try and make a flip book. OK. And you can do it with a pen. I also have Sharpies. If you want. Joy, do you want to try this? There you go. rolls. Okay. Um, does anybody want Sharpie? I found that it works better than um, ballpoint pen. So one way you can do it is try sm starting with a small circle and move to a big circle and have it move across the paper. Start with a line. Have a line move from one side of the page to the next. You want a bigger pen? Sharpie? Okay. Sharpies make everything better. Do you want a Sharpie? No, you're good? What? You can try whatever you want. You can try doing a stick figure, right? You can try doing circles. You can do a heart. You can do just a shape. You can have people move around, whatever you want. The world is your oyster. And if you need a little extra help, this is this woman's tutorial that I'll run in the background. So if you want to. This is the one I showed to the kids. And as you saw, some of them work from the back, some of them work from the front. It doesn't really matter either way. The idea is that if you work from the back, though, you layer the pages again and again, and then it's easier to see the line move. And I've got more post-its if you want to start over.
Yeah. Good. Oh, nice. Good job. So who feels like they're achieving some success in moving a shape, animating a shape? You did. Start in the back. Do you want to try again? Do you want to try again? I'll give you another. Okay. This is the fun part. Bless you. Yeah, so now trial and error, right? Try from the back and see. Did you want to try? It's fun. Yeah? I do the stuff when it rises. Yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Did it work? I, I, didn't, I, I want them to set it down, so this is for guys. That's the front, the, the up and the down, perfect. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so Sean and I had a conversation about doing some sort of paper prototyping that sh shows animation and timing. Um, but you could see from the first version to the second version, this was my, my second idea. It was like, oh, let's try it this way. And this is so much easier, and they don't have to cut paper out. Where do you teach? At the Academy for Software Engineering. I will be there on Tuesday. Can we meet? Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you my card. Great. Wonderful. Okay, I'll give you my card. Make sure. I won't. I won't. So, does anybody want to share uh, your po your flip book? If you want, why don't you share with your elbow partner? <laughs> share with your elbow partner your flip book. Okay, test it. I have I have a simple uh, line here. Yeah. That moves. Yep. And obviously it's not flipping, it's a little, uh, maybe black hole-ish thing. Okay. Yeah. But it was kind of going through the, the flip book, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah, with the Sharpie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here, I'll give you another one. Another one? Here. Go again? Well, if you want. Or if, if, the, if the mood, here, keep that one. If the mood strikes you. Yeah. So how did your partner do at your table? Did you test their book? How'd they do? How'd your partner do? You haven't done it yet? Oh, okay. Well, so what they were asked to do in their flip book, right, was to show the movement of the characters that they do on stage. Yeah. So it's 2D-ish though, right? It is, but this is the step back, do it, think about it, how does the movement work, how does timing work. If you just have someone on one page, suddenly the body's there and suddenly it's gone, does that show the movement, see? Okay, so what did you notice? What was this experience like? Uh, Fun. Okay, good. What else? I like adjectives. I kept thinking about uh, film going 24 frames per second and thinking how quick am I going to be <laughs> Yeah, I, I did a, I took one of the, the one they've got here that Asia made and I had to have a teacher flip it for me so I could videotape it. And, and she's like, am I doing it fast enough? And I'm like, I don't know, it is what it is. It's great, I can still see the bodies move. Um, I think it's really an interesting fun exercise because a lot of students have used flip books and maybe never force themselves to create one. And then it is more or less paper prototyping, but in a, you know, just doing wireframes can be boring yeah. or you know, even just simple blocking, even though it's useful. But if you're doing it with a partner, I like the idea that it gets you on the same page before you go through the painful process of coding you yeah. know, of your idea. You can both be like, what are you doing? Why are you putting it there? And it's like, I thought we were putting it here, but this kind of helps. Yeah, and the other thing I learned is that in having two pairs in a group of four do it, they had to make sure their flip books, in theory, looked similar, but they worked separately. So it was good for also groups to go, 
oh, well, while we weren't on the same page, we need to make sure we are. So it, it was kind of some checks and balances for them too. Yeah. So, so I helped Meredith do the past one of this. This book looks like it's entirely her. And so I, I haven't seen these this complete until like now where I see much more. And I also feel like there's the connection of like, you can have these conversations of, okay, let's look at these four pages. Like for mine, a circle got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, bigger. and you can have this concrete conversation of, okay, what's the difference between this one and this one? No, same position and circle is bigger. What's the difference between this one and this one? Same position and circle is bigger. And so you can have a more concrete conversation of like, oh, we can just repeat and scratch like the size command, right? Like, like you can attach a command to the difference between two frames. It's easier and more engaging than, hey, try and do that first. <coughs> more kids, I feel like, they're so to speak for the book. Yeah. There's something very powerful for holding it in your hands. Yeah. yeah. I like that. So you think you have like kind of big ways of what you want to build, and then you have to think of like tiny little details on how you can actually do it. And that's all about like the very right answer and how big a deal and how to break that tiny problem and resolve and then to build together just a big deal. So that kind of teaches them that process. Mm -hmm. But like a very like commanding paper. Yeah. The, one of the things that my kids have been really struggling with as far as theater skills goes is that is the emotional component of acting is really challenging for a lot of them. And this is not about that at all. So if kids are struggling with kind of the acting piece of theater, this is just another access point to think about the technical piece of theater, which is as important um, as getting up and, you know, I say, when you get up, you can't be yourself. I need to see someone else. You know, and, and that's really scary for kids. But this isn't about, this is just a stick figure on a piece of paper, right? So great, thank you for indulging me in that. So what I'm gonna ask you to do next is to kind of merge yourselves into kind of bigger groups, if you could. And um, can I see, who are CS teachers? Okay, so we've got, oh great. And then who are content teachers? So I'm actually a little unclear because I, I teach adults. I'm not actually sure what the okay. term content teacher is. So for example, I am not a CS teacher. I teach English and theater. So that would be content, even though CS is a content, okay. right? Um, meaning no, non-CS. Non-CS. Non -CS. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, so I'd love to have maybe two groups that have a mix of both at the tables. Because um, I'm going to ask you to do the following. Um, these are just some thinking questions, right? So CS teachers, in your discussion that you're gonna have, right, what are the skills, knowledge, concepts that are being taught to students through this exercise, which we've started to touch on? Why are they, the skills, important to the CS process of learning, right? Because as content teachers, we're al not always sure why these skills are important. Like, I, on a rudimentary level, I get why pa paper prototyping is important. However, I can't talk about what all the skills are that it's actually teaching students in the process of designing an app, right? Um, and then how can we make a more concrete connection between theater prototyping and computer science be made in theater or the CS classroom? And then content teachers, how can you adapt this for your classroom? What support do you need from a CS teacher in order to do something like this in your classroom? So um, here's your directions. I have three different entry points. So you can think about from a design standpoint. So in your group, work together to design a new project focused on a specific content. Whatever you want, it does not have to be theater. Think about assessment, right? You all have access to my rubric that's linked in the document in the master. Um, how can content teachers, how can they, can and should they assess CS work when they're not coders? And then, or refine my project. I have more materials. How can you improve the paper prototyping step for Flipbook 3.0 or something else? So right now it is, Sean, how much time do we have till? We have till 11.20 and right now it is 10.30. So let's, yeah, let's spend 20 minutes working in teams and pick one of the three entry points. Um, and let's spend 10, 20 minutes and then I wanna share out and kind of talk and hear about what people come up with. Sound good? Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, friends, brilliant, brilliant flipbook makers and teachers and thinkers. So, so let's let's talk a little bit about um, what you talked about in your group. If if any any and everyone wants to share out um, and talk a little bit about uh, takeaways and 
and maybe what your next steps are. I would love to hear kind of what your thinking is about your process and where this might go next. Who would like to go first? Me. Wonderful. Mr. Alada. <laughs> Done. Oh, um, I wish that I had been in here to, to get to make one, but when, when you showed me this, um, it was so, it, it's so well illustrated the concept of, of change and that students have such a hard time identifying, like, I have this idea, I want to write a program, but I need to first identify what changes between different states. Like, what, what am I going to remember and how many times does it change and things like that. So I'm going to now do this early on in uh, just like this directing this actual activity, it just needs to happen in a science class, and then have a discussion about like, what what is changing. So what should the program remember, and then how many times is it doing it, or like what is the actual change, and how would I express that change as a computation? So, how long do you think it would take students to kind of make that arc in the CS classroom doing this kind of activity? Um, one of the curricula that I that I really like is called. Is called Bootstrap. This would be the. This would be um, really early on. We would do this in one of the, the first few weeks. We have to write a. We have to write a function. Mm -hmm. That. Um, so like say this is moving up. Right. So I want to write a function that adds ten to the y coordinate, and I would. But I think I would first want them to to do this, and then we would design a function that that does the same thing. Mm -hmm. What ages, what, ages are, hmm? what ages are you teaching? I teach 9 through 12. Okay. And I teach a couple different curricula at that level, uh, for each level. So there, there are some students that are doing that are doing Java at the AP level, and there are some students that are 12th graders, but they're not as, as advanced as 11th graders, and they're all kind of all over the place. Um, but I think the, the core here is what is the, we always want to get students out of their brain Onto, into the computer. Like if you had to think about it, you needed to describe that to the computer to do. Mm -hmm. Or if my thumb is doing something, I need to get my thumb onto the to the to the, to the right. computer. Like right. Get your get whatever you're doing to get the computer to do it. That's the machine mm -hmm. whose job it is. Mm -hmm. You kind of started talking about motivation. that assessment was going to be difficult. But as we kind of talked through what you were assessing, um, it felt that if you wanted to assess code, then you should be, then the, the class should have the context of learning to code versus what we're talking about now, where we're assessing content. So then the first thing that you check for anybody's code is the behavior of the code. So does it do the thing that you said it out to do? What was the job to be done? Does it do that? Maybe at putting in a rubric of like the five things that you're looking for. That could be as simple as that in terms of assessment. So then the con then the what seemed to be the next the, the difficult thing is creating enough applicability uh, of code to things outside of typical CS, like building a to-do app or a calculator. Um, and how that can motivate your students. I think that was like the path we took to, to thinking about what's really going to motivate a learner to put the time in to learn Python, to learn multiple things, um, and figuring out what those use cases need to look like. So I think like blocking is a, is a great motivator. I came from I come from a film background, so this is like close to my heart, and I, I'm thinking, well, what other parts of the filmmaking process could we make better by code? Um, because we make nothing. Because we we've been making movies the same way since like 1914. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> other aside from talking and VFX, like it's been largely uh, the same in terms of process. Right. right. Um, so something I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. projects are percolating. Good. I think it's also interesting just act, the idea of how do you take out some objectives, some learning objectives out of this and think about how do they map to, let's say, other forms of art, whether that's, you know, maybe you don't get there with trying to help them create, you know, 
Monet paintings, but but op art style patterns where things are being repeated mm -hmm. or things are being layered on top of each other. It seemed like using some sort of programmatic approach or computational sort yeah. of way of designing patterns. Yeah, uh, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the idea of maybe just even identifying per age group, like okay, we're just going to try to get the idea of loops and the idea of translation of you know within a Cartesian plane, like that's just mm -hmm. enough to sort of this, this idea of, of establishing the, those ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then once you have those, let's say, five learning objectives, then kind of giving it to every discipline and saying, like, does this work for you? How could we create curricula that applies to these five ideas? Because we, you know, the idea of a computer scientist, um, you know, computer science teacher designing for good and saying, I think these five things, if a ninth grader could know these five things, they'd be in a really good place yeah. to think the about. The master skills. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so, I, 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 I had an idea that you gave me, but I'll say, I'll say, wait. And another idea, too. Is, you know, um, yeah, one of the things that I like about it, and this can apply to other maybe um, physical arts or even like sports in general, like physical education, is it allows for a prototyping process where you can like test out ideas and like other sort of plastic arts or like architecture, for example, you create models and like review things in various layers of resolution until you get something more. So theater obviously it's a time-bound thing, it requires human bodies to work, and so it's hard to like condense it into anything that you can create quickly and then evaluate quickly. And so to have something more like in theater, you could say, okay, everybody creates their own idea for plays and you kind of mock them up really quickly and then you get to vote on them and test them and like we can until you eventually can have a really clear idea of what yeah. fun probably looks like. It's a really interesting concept to bring to it. I mean, I remember being a kid, like writing plays, and it's just, yeah. it takes three months, and you don't have no idea if it's going to work until the very end. Right. Yeah, usually. like if you were prototyping your your play concept and, and pitching it. Yeah. Yeah. Hack, hack a play. <laughs> yeah. Especially, especially if you just break a play down into its components, which is like, here's a, we're going to say our play is 10 scenes, and then there's a reversal here, and then a big surprise ending mm -hmm. and then just to take that and have somebody do a pass at it and then group feedback and say like okay what's a different surprise that could happen in this section and, and you choose the, your own adventure yeah and just yeah. this idea that we're iterating through the structure of a play as well which is does anybody have a better idea for this section i like where we're going with this play but what about the different surprise what could it be or what could the different ending be here for this or the different opening scene where it mm -hmm. could take place not an airport where else right, right. and helping them just like realize like yeah it's it you know it's an iterative process yeah. all of our creative processes are which different. would be great for storyboarding in the film yeah when we do storyboarding there's storyboarding software but if you typically things are done by yeah. hand it's it's not that much there's not that yeah. many more iterations past the the post-it method yeah um it's just grids and you yeah. can do it so but you could storyboard scenes with scratch yeah you could yeah, you I can have that I'm excited about that collaboration because which one computer science. So the, just this whole and this whole collaboration with thinking about it um, as a as a theater you know, as a where where you're just looking at where you're just looking at the artistic aspect, not the computer science aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, computer science courses are are more and more going to become these interdisciplinary courses where we don't want students to make the the same old. Um, Fibonacci sequence program anymore because there's so much more you can do. But in my classes, I see that the the narratives kind of suck. They, 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 you know, they're I'm, I'm teaching a, a computer science concept, of, or I want them to to make a make a video game or, or make a an animation. But there's an entire uh, side of the development that would make that good that I don't that I don't fit well into my into my class. Mm -hmm. um, you gave me an idea, this is another another point. You gave me an idea. I don't know if you guys know this already, but I want students to be able to trace a program and, and understand what it's doing as as it executes. One of the things we do, you know, with the maybe the, the turtle graphics pen where you have to create those those tessellations and those really cool patterns and the kids can put loops inside of loops inside of loops and it does this cool thing but they don't actually understand you know how the how the iteration is working like they couldn't trace it out on paper and getting them to do it line by line is really hard what what if i gave them a program and and said 
make a flip book out of that. Program. Did you guys see that? This could be a way that I could assess tracing of a program. Oh, like reverse engineering. Well, I would, yeah. So instead of they do this first, they would I would give them the program and I would say, okay, you're the computer. You know, what are all the steps? Make it on the flip book. Show me what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. That would be That would be good because we we actually do that, but give them like a table where they have to like fill out the change of state in the table, mm -hmm. and it's it's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then, which which class? What grade do you do that with? Ninth, ten. Sean does it all. I mean, every yeah. every grade does every grade does tracing. Tracing is a mastery skill. Yeah. Like okay. just being able to follow the execution of a program at many many levels. Well, there's definitely those programs where it sort of like help this lunar this lunar rover navigate around often like an overhead sort of grid. Um, but it's interesting to me to say here are the steps that the lunar rover is supposed to take. Where on this map? Do you think it will end up if you follow these steps correctly? And for them having to walk through each one of those steps and think it through uh, and, and trace it out is, is kind of interesting. Or if we're talking about theater, what will be the stage picture at the end of this program once it's been executed? And I think like that kind of gets you there as well. This this idea of tracing through program where you know if it's not too complex, you can keep all of the steps in your head and sort of figure out like where it's going to end up or where it's going to be. Yeah, I really like the, uh, the, the turtley use of the flip book. It's like uh, kids, like if they produce like a table of numbers or something, it's not that, for a lot of them, they're not looking at that and it has any meaning to them. Whereas like these images or something, they, it's on another part of the brain and they can understand them. Would, wouldn't this work also for numbers? What if I wrote, what if I was just tracking the, the change of state of, a, of an integer? And I, and I, I, would, I could make a flip book, it would just go like, 9765432196543219, but it would look cool. Wouldn't it look cool if I just wrote numbers on each page? Wouldn't it? It would, right? Give it a shot. Maybe you still want to test this. What do we do? Well, because uh, when we're doing the, the we have a course that's like a prerequisite in Java, and a lot of it is just like you have a you have a you have a, a variable that's counting the number of, of times it's moving, and that's what you want them to keep track of or be able to trace how that how that number is changing. But I could say like k hey, is and and have a number where they have to write the change in the number. It would still be more engaging in those cases. This is a loop, you know? Like this, just, is a loop. this is a loop. Like, if you just have an infinite number of postages, it's an infinite loop. And, you know, it's like, you know, keep track, track of loops and inside of loops using this. I think it, it's well, like, that's what that, that makes me think of the idea of, of having seven stacks of these little post-it flip books that are all subroutines that could somehow be put together in an interesting way. I don't actually, I don't know the answer that. Let's pull up this one here. Let's that one. We'll go back to this one. Yeah, I don't know how that would work exactly. I can't, like, put it all together in my head. But that's what it sort of made me think about this idea of like you have 12 flip books to choose from which one of these gets the desired outcome and you could flip through them and sort of assemble them interesting yeah, right. or you have to find the problem in a flip book that prevents you from getting the outcome you could like you could stick you could stick one of those tabs on a page in the flip book that mm -hmm. kind of stops you from flipping oh yeah a stop like a stop <laughs> and then you have to like pick up the other flip book and flip it and then go back and keep flipping it the debug, the little debug. Like <laughs> yeah. Right? Do not pass go, do not click through. One of the things that I think that we got off track on, uh, but we enjoyed the conversation, was I think of something that you're speaking to, which is the motivation gap, right? This idea of hijacking their already, that they already have an interest, hopefully, in theater, and that's the thing that they find compelling. And I think a lot of us are less interested in Fibonacci sequences because. Fibonacci sequences are only compelling and interesting to a small subset of our students. Uh, and so what I, what I hope that a, a structure like this could do is give you, is to match the curricula with your particular motivation. If you think of yourself as a visual artist, awesome. If you think of yourself as a budding healthcare professional, great. If you think of yourself as a physicist in high school or that you, you think science and math things are coming online for you, here is a computational way to get into that subject matter. And 
hopefully like providing a tool set for each one of those secondary school teachers to say, here's what we've identified are just a, the best path of getting to those ideas with your student in your particular subject matter. Um, I don't know, that's to me like an interesting promise of an approach like this. It is just motivation a la carte, which is, hey, which of these things are most interesting to you, right? Uh, I think about this for our adults too, because we're just like, which one of these outcomes is most interesting to you? Being a web developer, being a game designer, you know, and trying to keep them aligned and motivated along that path through, through this very difficult journey of getting programming into your brain. Great place to stop. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you everyone for coming to my my workshop today. I really appreciate it. I hope you had a great time. I hope you have some takeaways that you can bring into your own classroom with your own communities and that you take some risks and collaborate and work with somebody to create something new. Thanks everybody.